Hey everybody, welcome to my home office again. Um, today we're going to chat about um, chapter number eight, cognition and cognitive processes. One of the things that, as your text notes, um, that's extraordinarily important is when you look at development of cognition and, and how it dovetails into attention. So what really the important aspects that you really need to sort of concentrate on is the fact that sustained attention, selective attention, and flexible attention are all prominent in development as we go forward with typical kids, as well as atypical kids. Um, our ability to concentrate in order to get a, see a task through is sustained, is sustained attention. One of the most important things I think one of that research has sought out, and your book has a big piece on this, is, is the cultural piece, is the cultural differences um, that appear to be extraordinarily significant in the aspect of the development of attention. So what I wanted to do today is really look at the um, Levine book and focus on a couple of the chapters that are related to um, the attention system. So first I'd like you to, you know, think about that and how that keeps you on task um, for just the right amount of time. So the first thing I'd like for you to do is just to sort of visualize and get a sense of when you think about a student with an attention problem. What does that student look like? And how do others around that student tend to respond to him or her? That kind of a mental picture in your head will help solidify some of the main points that we'll talk about in terms of uh, the attention system. Then also think about when you tell a student to pay attention. What are you asking that student to do? What does paying attention look like? And what does it mean? Do, sorry, does it mean that the student is looking at you? Does it mean that they're attending if they're making eye contact with you? If you're asking the student to think about what I'm saying, what are the behaviors that indicate that? If you're asking them to attend, also, think about what kinds of things are effective on that student's ability to attend. Does a student always have to attend in the same way? Or are there things that impact that attention? When you think about that, you might think about things like time of day. Do some students attend better in the mornings? Some attend better in the evenings? later in the day, not evenings. We know after lunch, there is always a tricky time for enhancing attention. So what kind of activities do we need our students to be engaged with that might result in greater attention? And what kind of activities may create less attention? What about the topic? How about emotion? How the student is feeling that day. What about sleep? Do students have sufficient sleep the night before? How about competing distractions? If there are loud noises in the hallway, if there's some kind of drill or construction going on outside, if there's a lot of talking going on in the classroom versus a really quiet classroom. So the important point here about visualizing all of this is really recognizing that attention is not just a characteristic that's inherent to the child. It's the child's ability to attend in interaction with all of those other things. It's time of day, it's type of activity, it's the topic, it's everything else. So again, just like everything we're pointing out in 
the other subjects that we're talking about during our class meetings. What are the implications of the environment that that child is interacting with? And in those interactions, are they resulting in the, child, in the child having attention problems in school? So let's look specifically at the visualizing in, in Levine's chapter, Conducting a Mind, Our Attention and Control System. The way he defines attention is, I think, a real good functional definition. It means maintaining focus on a, the right thing at the right time for the right amount of time. So that involves several different kinds of abilities in the child. So breaking down attention into three very different areas of control. One is the control over mental energy. That means, am I able to keep it up? Do I have an energy to keep my attention and my focus up? The second is how I take in the information, attend to it, store it in some way, and then there's output. Can I bring it back out and use it at the appropriate time? So let's take a look at each of these things that are focused on in the chapter. Mental energy control. These things are what controls the fuel for the brain to keep the brain focused and attending during that span of time. Typically, we are talking about the school day. So this is broken down into alertness, the energy that the child has for focusing and listening and watching what's going on in the classroom, the mental effort after just focusing to get started on and to continue working on and completing a task. It requires mental effort to be persistent through the whole process. It relates to the brain's ability to shut down at night. So getting a good night's sleep and then arousal to wake back up and be alert in the morning. And mental energy controls also relate to what he calls performance consistency. That means that you can count on your ability to get up and going and maintain a healthy flow of energy and pace in a predictable way throughout the day. If that's unpredictable, it becomes very difficult to manage a school day. So the first aspect of mental energy controls relates to the fuel in the brain, just in order to keep going and attending in terms of what's being needed to attend the day. Then when Levine speaks of intake controls, that's the thought of, okay, I'm attending. I need to start selecting and preparing. I need to start to interpret the incoming information. Selection control. I need to focus on what's important and ignore what isn't. I need to be able to focus my attention on what the teacher is saying or what the other student is saying in a discussion and try and disregard all the other information that's going on in the environment that isn't essential to my understanding of the task. That's selection control. Then depth and detail control. I need to process what you're saying deep enough in order to understand it, but not so deep that I get sucked down into all the ramifications of what you're saying. So you've seen people that take one bit of information and continue to perseverate on it. And you continue to think about it that one thing and when they are so focused on that one aspect of the message they're not able to take in the information about the whole message or any other pieces of information that are important during the time that you're sitting and attending 
Mind activity control is when you learn something new and want that to trigger prior knowledge and prior learning. You want that to think about what you've learned before to help it make sense, but not to let it take you off on a mind trip of, that, of this connecting to another thing, to another thing, to another thing. And so I'm no longer taking in the information about what's being shared at the present time. Span control is being able to stay focused for the right amount of time. And satisfaction control, which is a big one, and we all experience this here, to continue on to stay attending even when the talk, topic is not of interest to us. So all of these areas are part of what Levine calls intake control, all of which are part of the functioning and attending. And this is an area where a child may in fact be struggling. It becomes important to understand what piece of this challenge to the child so that they can become more efficiently addressed. Then we have output control. So now I'm attending and I need to start to think about and attend to what I'm producing as a result of having to attend. I need to consider the outcome of what I want to share based on the information that's come in. There's options control. Means, mm, okay, I'm ready to give output, but I need to exercise restraint. It doesn't mean I just need to blurt it out and act immediately anytime a thought comes into my head. Pace control is how quickly I put out the ideas or the things that I need to now be retrieved. And quality control is am I happy with the output that I'm producing? So reinforcement control, that's really learning from my mistakes. Am I able to fix what I'm doing based on the problems I've had before? So really all of these things clustered together our output controls. So when we're looking at signs of attention problems, we think about attention problems as they relate to each of these three mental areas and, and the energy that Levine has laid them out as. Signs of attention problems in mental energy areas, this difficult to difficulty to concentrate, being tired, feeling bored or distracted, those are the kinds of attention problems that seem to relate to mental, the mental energy area. And I'm going to pause right now. So now looking a little bit more at the chapter, when we talk about memory retrieval, it works in a couple of different ways. Recall is when we have mental representations of stimuli that involve creating something that's no longer sort of there. That's rec recall. Recognition involves the identification of the stimulus that's the same or similar to previous experiences. So when we talk about the different strategies that we use in terms of memory, um, there's three strategies sort of that we can choose from. And I think that every person uses all three or even a combination of both, of, of all of them, rehearsal, organization, and elaboration. So really, rehearsal is really the most basic of memory strategies. And it's 
a method that really is adopted when a child um, begins school, right? Um, mastery of this type of thing usually happens somewhere around the middle childhood years. And it's doing things over and over and over again, um, rehearsing, so, and, and it does include self-talk. Organizing, and again, you want to look at it, at it from a developmental point of view. When we have an organizing strategy, it involves taking information in ways that make it meaningful to us, right? Including it in a, to an existing schema. And somewhere around the age of nine or so, it really becomes much more effective. Think about the discussion that we had in Piaget. Older children tend to combine both rehearsal and organization for the best effect. So in other words, it takes a certain amount of development in order to take both of those and use those two things effectively. When we talk about elaboration, it really takes information um, and creating things that attach visualization of words, creating a, a, a almost a smorgasbord of things that our brain sort of creates. It's the multi-sensory modalities that we tend to use to create these wonderful mental images. And that kind of type of thing really occurs much more in older children. So as we continue to sort of look at using our memory system, right? Um, there are kind of these three components that Levine speaks of in uh, his chapter number four. Short-term memory, active working memory, and long-term memory. So in our short-term memory, that's where we hold information for a few seconds till you kind of decide what to do with it. You get information and then you decide whether you're gonna use it. If you think you're gonna hold it, then you start those rehearsal strategies that the book spoke of to practice the information, to hold it and store it. If we think we need to remember it, then we might have to recode it or rephrase it in other words, putting it in our own words to try and hang on to that in our fleeting short-term memory. The rate of input, when somebody tells someone to slow down, it is important because that bit of slowing down may help us to remember it more deeply. So, um, I'm just trying to think if I'm going to do this. So here's a list of 12 words. What I want you to do is look at it. I'm only going to show it to you for five seconds. And don't start writing until I tell you to tell you to until I take the words away. So make sure you have a pencil and paper. All right. So here's ready to, here we are. We're ready to go. Go. I'm going to have you stop. That was practice. Now I'm going to show you this list of 12 words for five seconds. Have your pencil and paper ready. Okay. Go.
Okay, now write down what you remember. Okay, the last one we're going to do is see if you can get better at this. All right. Okay, I'm going to count five seconds. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Okay. Write down now what you remember. So one of the things you might want to note, sorry, let me have me disappear, is that if you look at the words again, you'll see that there were initially, sorry, making you, making your head spin. There were, there were furniture, four types of furniture, four foods and four actions or verbs. So if you were able to cluster those, you might be able to rehearse those. So table, chair, couch, hot dog, pizza, hamburger, salad, run, walk, skip, hop. Then they go away. You may not remember them. And you probably wouldn't. But you should remember more than you remembered if just, if just an isolated, if it was just doing isolated word lists, right? So if you continue to sort of look at this, The next one is, if you look at it, it's really a sentence, right? So it's, so it's a way of making sense. It's not, a, it's not in chunking, but it's a way of sort of making sense. And it, it allows your short-term memory to, again, hold on to these things, depending what the activity is. We keep that information in our short-term memory in, in a lot easier way. So the first set was random. The second set was sort of clustered. And the third set was a related sentence. So the thing is, is that there is, this is where long term memory information is saved, right in long term memory. And it's about storage and retrieval. And this is really of critical importance, because we don't want kids to just be able to use their memory information and keep it up and be available for now. We want it for them to be able to look at tomorrow and the next week and the next year and to be able to pull things back out of retrieval to make sense. Um, so they, they, to make sense of things, to know that they had learned something from before. So information is saved for future work. So it's really important to how a child does this and how they how it's filed. How is it systematically put in long term memory and the better kids file in a way that's meaningful, the better a child is able to then find it later and to access information. So some of the strategies that we kind of looking, we're looking at um, is again, bridging those gaps between short term and long term memory. We tend to looking at how uh, retrieval happens when a child is able to recall large chunks of knowledge on demand, those are the kinds of things like multiplication facts that have, we wanna talk about automatic access. 
in recognition, we need a child to know that, that what they've encountered, that they've encountered the information before. Okay. And we often hear, oh, I didn't learn that before. And their previous teacher knows that that was taught. So the lack of recognition of what you've encountered with this information before, and it's often, it's how it's stored in long-term memory. So then there's sort of an, an, um, a, pro a process, right? An automation process, this automatic process. Information needs to be accessible without effort. This is why we have sight vocabulary that's important for reading. Because if a child has to stop and read every single word and figure it out and sound it out and figure out the meaning of each consecutive word, there's not going to be any reading comprehension. We have to count on automization so the child can quickly recall, identify, and put it into context. That's one of the reasons why multiplication facts are worked on to get down to an automatic level. So that when a child solves a larger math problem, that they can count on those things that they know that are easily retrievable. And it doesn't have to further the components of learning something in order to then also then go and master an even more specific skill. So retrieval um, in long-term memory is really super important. And that's why we encourage um, that these kind of skills are nurtured in order to be successful in school. Um, we encourage and practice exercise right in your memory and we want you to remember something and able to retrieve it well we need to transform knowledge um, as it's coming in you remember something by changing it so for the example um, if you've got the information visually if you saw it in a chart or a table make it verbal, talk about it, explain it. The process is transforming that knowledge from one form of the other is the practice of the exercise for your memory in order to, for you to store it. And that's why in what we do, we remember that in school, we want students to be able to elaborate on it, information, connecting new information with prior learning, asking questions like, what does this stuff fit with? Or what does it remind you of? Or, oh yeah, it's similar to what we talked about and here it's right here and these are the similarities and connections between the different types of knowledge. So we need to encourage the practice and exercise children's memories in this storage and retrieval system. So making arrangements are our own, our own ordering system um, is an important concept that uh, we talk about also in Levine. And it's about creating, sorry, I just lost my place. Um, I tell you what, let me take a pause, find my place again, and I'll get back to you. Hey, I'm back again. Sorry about that interruption. Um, I was rummaging through some papers and, and didn't want to um, expose you guys to this. In, in the chapter six book in Le Levine, it's about our ordering systems. And this is really a critical part of how we develop um, language, pragmatics, um, how we take information and process it 
placing it in, in order in some sort of a sequence. So he talks about two different things, um, sequential ordering as well as spatial ordering. And if you think about it, our world, especially in academics, has a very structured way of having information put out to us. If it's a number system, it's a letter system, um, calendars, again, seasonality, things like that, that's sequential ordering. Um, when we talk about this in terms of perception, kids need to know this and know that there's some internal order in all the sequencing that we work through. Um, so we have this sequential memory that we see it in, in elementary school and especially middle school is remembering the order of things. When we talk about sequential output, it's relating information in order. That's really important when we get into more sophisticated ways of writing, um, speaking and thinking. Um, again, it's a cognition piece. Sequential organization in terms of time management. How do we take the time that we have and use it in an effective way? And then there are things like higher sequential thinking, which is about reading lists of numbers and figuring out what comes next, um, or story problems in terms of math. So these are very an integral part of our academic work is our sequential perception. I will put up some uh, pieces that are sort of in addition to for, for your reading about strategies, when we talk about strategies for sequence, teaching sequence. Um, when you look across our curriculum, if you look at each of the different curriculum subject matters, there are integral ways that the sequencing happens. In math, it's about solving problems in a format. In social studies, it's about the sequential events of history. In the writing process in language arts, it's the how-to, it's the steps, it's putting a paragraph in place in a specific order. Science, again, there's a sequential part of um, creating an experiment, um, and there are specific steps that have to be taken in a specific order in order to get the outcome that we're looking for. When we talk about spatial ordering, again, it's that how things are, things are organized in place. It's directionality, it's um, reading maps, uh, look at the two desks. Um, it's that order to the spaces and places around us. If you look at the money, it's, it's not just money, it's size, um, is, it, is it heads or tails? It's um, what, it, what do we visually see on the, um, on the coinage to identify it um, in order to hand the person the correct coin. So spatial ordering is also extraordinarily important and our spatial perception, how we get oriented in the world, how we are organized in space has these components as with spatial ordering. And again, think about what we need to do to be successful, not just in school, but in navigating a bigger world. There's a spatial memory to, again, different shapes of coins, how letters are formed. Spatial memory is extraordinarily important. Output, it's using a plan, a piece of graph paper. A ruler is about space. Staying on straight lines, it's how we, the output that we create, what the organization of that is. Spatial organization is about material management. Lots and lots of kids who have um, challenges with learning. Also, you will see a challenge in material management. Um, 
issues with spatial disorganization, how things are not in place. Um, higher spatial thinking is about understanding a broader concept. In other words, take the example of how you create a jet forward motion has to do with airflow. The concept of a partial eclipse is the space of how the moon orbits around the earth. Things of that nature are connected with our spatial perception. And the concept of metacognition, and again, your book talks about this also, it's the processing that enable us to reflect upon what we're doing and if it is working for us. The concept of mind reading, for example, using um, metacognition in social context, reading the room. Um, these are really important pieces in terms of our cognitive development. And children gradually develop this as they adapt into their environments. Problem solving is evident at childbirth. Um, it's about who we are as human beings, almost literally. Um, it begins as a means to an end behavior. In other words, finding milk to survive is looking and sucking and imitating those behaviors of how an infant anticipates the future event of being nourished. Um, somewhere between eight and 10, 12 months, the infant engages a more intentional behavior. So following this kind of phase, kids create and make rules, um, and that includes make-believe play. Um, using tools helps for kids to develop reasoning skills when they have multi-step problem solving to do. Um, and that's really important as we go forward is to determine that the child themselves determine the problem and then use the tool to assist them in creating a solution. And that's why we talk about it's so important for make-believe play is really a place where children develop those cognitive and social competencies that include problem solving and rule following. So if we look this week, or this chapter, I should say that during childhood, children really have a lot of information processing skills that they learn and pro progresses very quickly. And you look with some of the immature attention and memory systems and they continue to emerge into um, highly evolved complex thinkers by early adolescence. So we will wrap this up for now and we'll see you again in the next chapter.